it was front page news there for a couple yeah. of days and it was not great. You, you, you know how it is, Will. It's not great to be in the papers, no. um, especially when it's made up. No, I remember I saw the, saw the headline uh, <laughs> down here in, when I was doing some and research. And I bet you thought it was true, didn't you? you, actually. <laughs> and I bet you thought it was true. Welcome to Building Ideas, the Master Builds SA podcast. I'm your host, CEO Will Frogley. Join me as I speak with some characters from South Australia's building industry. A lot has changed in 40 years, but one thing hasn't, hard work. It's what our members do, and it's what we do for them. Seabus Super, making hard work pay off since 1984. You need a good team to be successful, and luckily I've got a great team around me at Master Builders SA, and Today's an opportunity on building ideas to find out a bit more about one of them, and that's Kim Morgan, uh, General Manager of Public Affairs. Kim, welcome to the Building Ideas Podcast. Thanks, Will. Look, I've been waiting my turn to uh, have a segment on Adelaide's greatest podcast for quite a while, so pleasure to <laughs> So you feel, pri- you to feel privileged? Very privileged. Very privileged. Uh, yeah. No, Not many is... people do, but that's all right. We'll, <laughs> we'll get there. So Thanks I guess me. I guess we, we talked about this and whether we wanted to weigh into some serious policy discussions for the industry, but we do that all day, every day. So we thought we'd take a bit of a different slant today and, and just find out a bit more about Kim Morgan as a person and his journey and how he ended up at Master Builders SA. So uh, tell us a bit about yourself, Kim, firstly, you know, how old you are, you know, have you always grown up in Adelaide, that type of thing? Yeah, I feel like a job interview here, Will. No, look. Uh, I said it was informal, remember? Very proud South Australian, Will, uh, and grew up here. Uh, one of five kids, uh, two younger brothers, uh, an older sister and a younger sister. So sort of five kids bookended by uh, the two sisters and then three boys Big in family. Middle. Big family and an amazing childhood, to be honest, growing up in um, Adelaide. Very, very proud South Australian. It, as you can imagine, in a house of that size, it was... Yeah, just a lot of fun. It was uh, chaotic, but good fun. Sports mad in my house as kids. So that was a big part of my um, my childhood, to be honest. And, and whereabouts uh, did you grow up in Adelaide? I uh, grew up in uh, Unley. So I went yeah. to Glen Osmond Primary School and then attended Glenunga High School. Yeah. So yeah, uh, back Glenunga was a bit different back in the 90s to what it is now. <laughs> I see it now at the top of the uh, the pops for academic. It was yeah, that's of, right. I would say it was a transitioning school when I went there. The IB had just come in, and it was certainly you know I, I actually remember as a year six, seven, a lot of a lot of the parents had gone. I've been, you know, if they're going to go to a public school, Unley was the one they wanted to go to, and yeah. it's it's amazing to see Glenlangas um, transition actually, Will, and um, yeah, uh, yeah, I had a great time there. A lot of a lot of friends still from. The Glenunga High Days, and yeah. yeah, from there, sort of, what did I do? I mean, yeah, went into went into uni and and all those things. But um, yeah, I, I suppose um, for me, sport was, as I said, a big part of big part of my early life growing up as well. Yeah, my sister in law is a teacher at Glenunga, and she's certainly very proud that they they're top of the top of the tree in the performance stakes. But you you sports mad. So what what sports um, were you into as a, a lad growing up? Most kids in South Australia, footy, cricket, tennis, basketball, anything. But footy, AFL mad uh, as a kid. And that was, you know, that was all I wanted to be as a kid was a, a footballer. I mean, yeah, you know, I was, you know, I'd, I'd like to say I was uh, transitioning towards being the next, you know, Ben Hart, but that wasn't quite true. But um, no, I was, I was. Well, you look a bit more like Stevie J. Though, <laughs> Stevie J, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. But no, look, I was, I was okay. I was. And I, I suppose to me, I was obsessed with footy as a kid with my brothers. Probably a big turning point for me, I reckon. I was I was playing a lot of people my age remember the old Sandboy Cup. Do you remember the Sandboy Cup? Yeah, yeah, and I, absolutely. I was, I was playing a Sandboy Cup game for Sturt actually under fifteens, and muddy day at Unley Oval, and I got my knee stuck in the mud and got tackled, uh, and I, I did my um my ACL, and the surgeon a guy called Wilson Lee very well-known surgeon around Adelaide said to me afterwards, you know, you need to do straight line sports going uh, forward. And I was, I, I'd already made a state team in the 1500 in athletics at that stage, I, but I didn't like athletics. I loved footy and I um, was pretty, you know, as a 15 year old cut up at that realization, but the coach 
who coached me in athletics, he gave me two things that sort of changed the course of my sport, I suppose. One was a book called The Golden Mile, which is about Herb Elliott, who was arguably one of Australia's greatest ever athletes, won the Rome 1500 by record margin and world record time, never lost over the mile of the 1500. And the other was a, a video by the BBC called Clash of the Titans. Clash that, of the Titans. And that was about Sebastian Coe versus Steve Ovette, the two great British yeah. athletes in the build up to the 1980 Moscow Olympics. And, and watching those two videos, I suddenly understood the history and the uh, importance of the 1500 as an event. So for the next 10 years, I was really focused on my um, middle distance running. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Talk to us a bit more about your running. So, fifteen hundred meters. Do you say was your your specialty? That was my yeah. It was funny. I was that was my specialty. As a kid, I never had the fifteen hundreds a uh, real speed meets endurance event. Yeah, you know, it's a bit of a nasty distance where it's quite lactic acid intensive. So you've, you've almost got to be a skinny sprinter, I suppose. Yeah. I, I never had the speed as a kid to to. I won a couple of national medals as a junior in the steeplechase, which is a bit more. I suppose you're less blue ribbon. You guys that aren't quite good enough for the 1500 going to the steeplechase. But in the 1500 at national level, I just I just didn't have the speed to go with them. Um, yeah. And then when I was 18, I I did I got a stress fracture in my navicular bone in my foot, and that, I thought that was a really a really bad thing at the time. And I was out. I missed two years, and I eventually had to have a pin put in my foot. But those two years I spent, I went. I did a bit more cross training. I went back to Sturt for a little while. And I got a lot more. When I came back, I was three or four seconds quicker over the 400. I just, just from all that cross training. And then suddenly I got into the 1500 and I was, had the speed and I, I won a couple of state titles then. And I ended up going off to, on a college scholarship to, to Memphis in Tennessee and Memphis, spent, a, Tennessee. spent a year there. So that was a, that exactly. was probably the best year of my life, I reckon. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. that was just doing college competitive athletics in, in America. Yeah. Yeah. On the yeah NCAA circuit over there. And yeah, incredible time. It was probably the the closest. I'll, it was amateur, obviously, yeah. strictly amateur, actually. The, yeah, uh, yeah. the NCAA circuit, and there's been the odd controversy with that over the years. But the depth of competition was remarkable. Um, College sports just seems so well set up. Yeah, it? it's a really big deal, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I couldn't. I just yeah, you know, as a kid who'd grown up dreaming of being you know in elite sport, you, you'd be on a bus one week to Missouri, and then the next week you'd be driving up to Wisconsin or you'd be out in Illinois and you'd be running in there with these small, you know, you might be running in a small cross country meet or a small whatever meet, but it was um, an amazing little time. And um, yeah, came back and sort of had my best year when I came back, ran, ran about a four minute mile, but was never quite there. And then, and then unfortunately again, the old knee <laughs> injuries caught up with me and I, I sort of had to kiss it all goodbye by about 25. But by then I was sort of ready to do other things with my life. And in terms of other things, uh, I mean, what, what what were you studying when you went to college in America, for example, <laughs> when, when you came back? Yeah, not much. <laughs> studying no, I, the art of life. I only like, had a, art of partying probably as well over there. Uh, oh no, not me, Will. No. <laughs> <laughs> I had a degree before I left, and that actually meant I didn't actually actually have a lot of eligibility left. So I was only there. I wasn't there for that long, so I couldn't yeah. pick up another degree there. But when I got back, I did a post grad in journalism. I think. Came out of running at 26 and the two things that really, that can be a pretty tough transition actually. And I, I think, I think cycling, athletics and swimming can be some of the toughest sports to transition out of. You know, I look at me, I was training, I reckon 15, 16 times a week and the structure that gives you is huge. And then all of a sudden that structure has gone. But um, two things, so I just met my, um, my wife around the time I stopped. So that, that was really good for me. And then I'd also, I reckon I'd just either broken into a cadetship with messenger for news corp or I was about to, and I was able to throw my, throw all that focus into that, into that. And, and that, that sort of, that was the next chapter from there for me. It's a good trading ground, isn't it? The messenger press or any kind of regional media, um, you, yeah. Well, it certainly used to be. Uh, you really had to get your hands dirty and do any number of things any day, and you had constant deadlines. It, it, it bred good habits, I think. And this is something you and I have talked about before. It's a bit sad that the media's died in the last few years. Not well, not died, but it's been on a decline, and a lot of young guys and girls coming through don't have the same opportunities that we had. Because I look back at my time in Port Lincoln, it was very memorable. 
Hundred percent. Yeah, the messenger for me was terrific. Uh, great culture, and you're right. Incredibly high standards of training and quality. And they, you know, I, I mean, like most of them, when I got in there, I was I had a lot to learn. <laughs> Very green. I was and, greener than green when I went in there. <laughs> and, but they beat that out of you over the next yeah. over that twelve months. Really high standards. I think I was swimming. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I think I look now at the people that I started with there, and I think I was in the Morfittville office which was which is no no longer there and adam todd was there he's now yeah. obviously you know media or communications manager to the melanoscus government had a great career but there were i could name five or six others in there at that time among those pool of 15 journalists who are all having great careers so that that was terrific for me i spent nine years i think at news corp i think the first the first two or three were as a cadet journal then i was the sports editor there for Three years. That was a brilliant. Um, that must have been very enjoyable. Time. Being sports editor. Yeah, it yeah. was. I was sort of. A, I sort of. Um, now, now there's a rumor, and maybe you can <laughs> maybe you can confirm it go. for the building ideas audience. Yeah. Did you, in fact, ghostwrite Ruse's uh, column for the advertiser? Uh, can for you 12, confirm or deny that? For twelve months, I did indeed. I. Uh, <laughs> I think I don't want to take all the credit there. I think Reese Homfray would have ghostwritten it before me. But yeah, I, I did ghostwrite for him for a year and. Um, I remember, see, I remember I really, that being a I shot really, I, to, I, oh my God, this person doesn't actually write their own column. Well, I was horrified. He, he, it was all his ideas. <laughs> I just helped him articulate them, Will. But uh, no, he was great, actually. Ru, a, a nice guy. Shout yeah, out um, to Rue. Good man. Yeah. He's doing a good job on Triple M. He's, he's had me on there a couple well, of times. Well, and I reckon the, the measure of a person is when the cameras are off. You know, we know he's an icon in Adelaide. And I think, like most people, he, he was a, just a nice guy to work with and yeah. um, treated, treated people well when he didn't have to. And, um, so yeah, no, I did that for yeah. I I ended up sort of I think the Tizer and Messenger merged at that time, and so I, I got on the Tizer sports desk, and yeah, it was sort of living the dream a bit there. Will I was uh, doing a bit of footy calling as well on community radio, and then on ABC and writing sport articles for a living for a few years there. Um, so it was a it was a great time. Calling the games, calling the big games, calling the odd game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could break into a. You ever caught a, a horse? commentary? Yeah, for you. ever, ever no. caught a horse race? <laughs> no, that's a that's a. Uh, that looks that, like a serious skill. different skill, yeah. That, no. that looks like a very, you yeah. Know, yeah. I don't think too many people. I mean, if you go to the average have... person off the street and said, slammed you in front of the microphone and said, all right, call this horse race right now, imagine, seeing, be much them calling, imagine yeah. seeing them flounder. <laughs> <laughs> here, comes, here comes the big thoroughbred down the outside. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, being able to pick the numbers and, and you know, call that through binoculars, it, oh, it would all come down to research, I'd imagine, and yeah. Yeah, an incredible... Um, I think skill. I think quite a lot of footy fans could do a passable job in commentating footy, but that the, calling a horse race that's, yeah. that seems like a different level to me. A different level, I agree. Yeah, yeah. but even calling the footy that it's and frenetic, frenetic, frenetic <laughs> and even frenetic. calling even calling the footy. I mean, when in Sanford where I was doing when the ball's 150 meters away and you're trying to call it through binoculars, it isn't easy to yeah. to pick up the players. But yeah, that was a bit of fun. So a long time at News Corp, and then where did you go after that? Yeah, I'm, I um, it was a <laughs> this will be a funny, funny story here. This is a bit, bit random, but I, I suppose I could see the writing on the wall a little bit for newspapers at that time. This is sort of 2015, 16, and oh, I think the the decline of headcount had started in editorial rooms around mm. the the country at News Corp, and I always had an entrepreneurial streak in me. I would say as well, and I don't know something, maybe something about that running career I talked to you about. You know, it breeds a bit of aspiration, I think, and yeah. all those things. And I, 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 through a friend of mine, I started getting into e-commerce a bit, and he, he, he showed me a, a few little tricks, and I ended up negotiating a few wholesale accounts with a few le- few major welding suppliers around mm-hmm. Adelaide, and I was drop shipping their equipment on a little website I set up. The thing was, I got a couple of major wholesalers, Sigwell Sab and Unimig, who are big welding guns of Australia, big wholesale. I didn't. Realised what I'd started there. To be honest, I thought mm. it might, you know, might might make me a little bit of hobby income. But it got really busy really quickly, and I had to quickly go. Oh, shit, what am I going to do here? Do I pull out of this, or do I put the journalism to one side? I decided to put the journalism to one side, and then yeah. suddenly I had this business that was quite significant for a couple of years there, and um, but probably didn't quite know how to scale it. I, I got it really big and really turning over a lot of money and making a little bit of money. And um, shipping a lot of welding equipment around the country, um, and I got an offer. Someone offered to buy that business, and I, um, I was like, "Yep, that's that's what I need to do." Good here. time to get out, get, get out, yeah. and yeah, help him try and transition the business. So I spent eighteen months 
in the business after I sold it. And that was probably a pretty tough time, to be honest. I, I, the business probably got taken a little bit in, in a direction. Different, you mate, yeah, a little yeah. bit. And it was just hard and sapping. And so, yeah, I, I came out of that a bit tired. And um, what, what year was this when you came uh, out? Of that? Ooh, 2018, I reckon. 2018. Yeah, yeah. 2018, yeah. 19. Yeah. yeah. So that was an amazing. I learned a lot, though. Learned a lot from that. And obviously, yeah. financially, it was. A rewarding little period for me and um, gave me a few options for the next chapter. It's good. So mm. what happened after you kind of had that transitionary period out of the business you started with a new owner? What happened then? Yeah, yeah. 18 months with him and then I was sort of released from that arrangement and then I was like, okay, what do I do now? And it was yeah. a bit of a weird period. What am I? At this point, am I an entrepreneur? Do I go and start another business? Do I go back into journalism? And I um, had two young kids at that time and it had actually been a, a probably – tough period trying to, uh, two beautiful girls, Charlotte and Elise, and I wanted to put a lot more time into them. So I um, thought I'm not going to start another business. That wouldn't be the right thing to do. Yeah. And I just thought, I think I need to get back into that public affairs communication space. Well, because, um, yeah, that, that that's sort of what the journalism skills had had set me up for. I also had all these new skills in marketing that I'd learnt along the way through e-commerce. And so I felt like that was the, the way to go. And yeah, that sort of, I suppose, indirectly led me to where I am now working for you. It's it sort of, it, it, yeah, I, I just sort of naturally gravitated probably to more into the political area. I'd always had an interest in that public affairs policy in the in that political industry space. Um, so so came to you via, via the Northern Territory. Yeah. And what hmm. were you doing in the Northern Territory? I know, I know what you're doing, you know obviously, doing. but the yeah. uh, audience doesn't. So yeah. what were you doing up in the Territory? And how, I, and how did you end up there? I, I spent a few years at NBN Co, and that was a great little time in uh, head of, well, not head of anything, to be honest. I was sort of communications and engagement on the NBN rollout, and I was spending some time in the Territory, um, quite like Darwin, and an opportunity yeah. came up to, you know, a, a mate flicked me a job out as a bit of a joke, you know, um, media manager for the chief minister job came up there. I threw my resume. Michael Gunner. Michael Gunner. Michael um, Gunner. Didn't think I'd have much show like that. And then suddenly I got a call, did an interview, uh, went all right. And then I got a call from Michael Gunner himself. And yeah. um, we spent, I think, five minutes talking about politics and half an hour talking about SNFL football. <laughs> and, I, and I think that... <laughs> That sealed the and deal. I, I think he, yeah, I think he wanted someone that's uh, yeah. like sport because I didn't certainly have, wouldn't have said I had the political runs on the board to take that role. But yeah, we I had 18 months with Michael and he was, I think, a, a great leader up there actually through the COVID period. Yeah. Uh, that was, so that was, yeah, yeah. I could write a book about that period, I reckon, Will. It was um, an amazing time because, um, yeah, I think the Territory did a great job of, um through the pandemic of um, protecting a pretty vulnerable cohort of people. But um, yeah, it was it was during that period where obviously trying to get the vaccination rate up among Indigenous Territorians was, it was a big focus. And from my point of view as the uh, managing his media, it was frenetic. It was um, daily press conferences, you know, especially once COVID, the incursion started in the territory, and um, COVID, and, and COVID made, got in, and lockdowns, and snap. Yeah, there's some amazing times. And, up there. and you made yeah. a bit of a name for yourself at one point up there, didn't you, Kim? Uh, <laughs> so tell us what happened with an, an infamous encounter with a uh, Alice Springs businessman. Oh well, it was a, it was a political. <laughs> you, 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 you made um, some, you made some media there. Some headlines. Yeah, what happened there? Well. Jeez, thanks for bringing that up. Um, look, uh, I want to tell colourful stories on good ideas. <laughs> Can't all be yeah. dry. No, look, it was it was it was a non-story really. Alice Springs is an interesting place. Uh, obviously, Michael Gunner was a Labor uh, leader. There were probably a few people out to get him. Yeah. And anyway, he and I had done, uh, well, he'd done a press conference up there. That night, we went out for dinner to the casino. It was round one of the 2022 AFL season. He was a big Carlton fan, so we went to watch um, Carlton play um, Richmond, I reckon, uh, to kick off the AFL season. And um, anyway, he um, sort of had a guy talking very close to him. And it was in, during, in an aggressive way. Well, or? it was during it was during the um, a period where he was getting death threats. Yeah, because he was he'd mandated the vaccine. Yeah. So, and and some of them were really disturbing. And yeah. that he'd actually, I don't know if I can say this because it never came out, but I, I believe he'd been he, he had someone publicly attack him. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Um, story there for someone that hears this to pick up. 
so anyway, I just sort of checked in and said, you know, mate, can you give me a bit of space? Yeah. And I didn't think much of that. And then the, the gentleman, um, who was a bit of a political agitator in Alice Springs, turned himself on me and basically said, who are you, mate? And lots of other colourful language there. <laughs> I said, look, I'm just told him who I was and just said, look, you know, just checking in on him because of what I'd explained to you. Um, this guy sort of came back later in the night and he was, he was wired up. I'll say no more than that. Yeah. Uh, and he sort of said, um, you're finished, mate. I'm going to finish you. I said, okay. There was something a bit ominous about that. And anyway, that was it. That was all it was on the night. A couple of nights later, I was uh, at my daughter Charlotte's tennis training. I was had the, the ball pick her up a wheel, just picking up some balls, and my phone just suddenly goes, ping, 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 ping. <laughs> Um, I, know, I know that feeling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it was a, hey, mate, you've got to get back to parliament. You've been named under parliantary privileges telling an Alice Springs businessman, can I, can I drop language here? Yeah, of course you can. And fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 um, and a lot of people thought that, that Naomi thought that was very believable. So it was, it was quite a beautifully planted story by this guy. But yeah, yeah Robin Lamley. Look, I mean, it was defamatory, and if it wasn't said under parliamentary privilege, I would have sued her because it was it was false. Yeah. And um, yeah, don't vote for her this weekend in the territory election if you're voting. Yeah. It was pretty <laughs> disappointing. But look, I came out and denied it, and it was a bit of fun. It, it did it, it was front page news there for a couple yeah. of days, and it was not great. You, you you know how it is, Will. It's not great to be in the papers, no. um, especially when it's made up. No, I remember I saw the saw the headline uh, <laughs> down here in. When I was doing some and research, I bet you thought it was you true, didn't I hide you? you, Ashley? <laughs> and I bet you thought it was true. I thought, well, maybe yeah. I need that. Maybe I need a bodyguard like that myself <laughs> with the dangerous role that I sometimes yeah. play. But, That's right. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to be jumping in between you and the sea for me, you. Would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, thanks, Kim. No, it's right. Thanks, Kim. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so you you're working for Gunner, and then what what what, what happened after Gunner uh, stepped down? Yeah, Signing I, exhaustion, didn't he? I I think he. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. I mean, he tough going think, through that COVID period as a leader. Well, yeah, you look at all those um, COVID leaders: Dan they Andrews, Palaszczuk. Um, I've had a mental blank over in the West. Um, yeah, McGowan. McGowan. Uh, yeah, within eighteen months, they were all gone. And but yeah, I think he felt it was the right time to step back. Job done. Job done to some extent. All the COVID restrictions were coming off. It was, I suppose, you know, we know COVID's. I don't want to. Certainly downplay what's happened since, but co the, the real threat was over. Yeah. So he stepped away. Yeah, it was a bit of a crazy time. I, I uh, went across and worked as the chief of staff to the skills minister, Will, uh, Paul Kirby, and had a great 12 months working for him. And he wasn't just a skills minister. He was he had six portfolios. They're, they've got a lot. Only eight ministers in the cabinet up in the territory, plus the chief minister, so nine, nine all up. And yeah. they – Big workload. So he also had agriculture, small business, major events, veterans affairs. So it was a frenetic time, but a great time as well. And yeah, I, I love the skill side of it. I suppose um, we we got some some good things done in that that short time. And national skills signed the national skills agreement. Real passion for trying to get uh, more more Indigenous people, in particular in the territory, to to yeah. I mean that's a that's a tough problem to solve, but trying to get them into uh, more rewarding career paths. So yeah. that was a really great year, but um, it was time to come home at the end of the year. Yeah, my wife and I, by that stage, you know, we still get along really well, but after 14 years of marriage, we'd sort of grown apart, I suppose, and we, um, my kids were the, – the decision was made to come back here and get around our support network and our family. So I came back to Adelaide oh, uh, early early 2023, and that's about when uh, I think you gave me a call. Yeah, the, the experience you had working as Chief of Staff for the Skills Minister up there was, and the work you did with Master Builders Northern Territory was of real interest to me because, as you know, skills is something we've really focused on the last few years for obvious reasons because every member we speak to is crying out for more skilled people, and not, not just trades but uh, white-collar jobs as well. And yeah. what's so important in construction is if you don't have this, the skills there, construction takes longer, it's more expensive and quality can suffer. So you can really see how much we've focused on it over the last few years with some of the new programs we're rolling out, like Born to Build, Keeping Tradies on Track, the skill migration we're working on with the state government. Mm. Uh, so your, your kind of experience there and the good work you did with Masterbills NT certainly uh, came to my attention and – yeah, it's been great to have you in the team and and you utilising that knowledge and experience. Thanks, Will. Yeah, and I love. I'm. It, it's something I'm passionate to get out of bed 
Eto. And do, and you're right. In the territory, they had to look at skilled migration. It wasn't controversial at all up there. A, because yeah. they're so close to Asia, and I actually yeah. went to Dili, and we looked at how we could work more closely with Timor Leste, um, and that, and, and and we worked with industry and NT farmers and uh, master builders as well, and it was just uncontroversial up there. And I think it is here too, yeah. but it really. They're used to a transient yeah. population in the end, yeah. though, aren't they? That's right. And everyone's constantly yeah. coming in and going. And yeah, but yeah. I look at I look at our state at the moment, and um, finally we've finally got on to work after 25 minutes of you know we, we got there. But it, I, I'm so passionate about SA, and I think we've done a, a great job to transit to put our economy in a position where I think uh, we've got tremendous opportunity to set our state up to be a more prosperous place over the next 10 years. I think we've nailed a really good housing roadmap with the investment, you know, things like cutting stamp duty, which you've been so pivotal in, Will, for first home builders. Also, the uh, investment to unlock SA water bottlenecks. I think now workforce is what is going to hold us back if we don't have great plans. So, yeah, I'm really passionate about working with the government and um, I'm not sure when this will air, but hopefully by the time this is aired, we'll have the skilled migration pilot program up and yeah. running, and we can um, we can play a role in in helping build that capable building and construction workforce. Because you look at through time, I reckon yeah. the state with the most capability in building and construction and the the jurisdiction, um, they're the ones that that forge ahead. Yeah, that passion. That's one of the main reasons I really like working with you, Kim. Uh, like myself, you just you're really passionate about not just the uh, industry doing well, but the whole state doing well, and construction's got such a pivotal role to play if the can if the whole state's going to be performing well. So, I enjoy really working with you and kicking some goals, hopefully for the members together, and uh, no doubt there's many more good times to come. So, thanks for taking the time to come on to the podcast today, Kim, and let the uh, viewers know a bit more about your journey. Thanks, we've really enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for joining me on Building Ideas. For more information on master builders or our guests please visit our website at mbasa.com.au.